Hello and welcome to the Underappreciated Animals Podcast with Hatchling Makes, an animal-themed podcast filled with fun facts about species which aren't always the main feature in nature documentaries, but are getting a chance in the spotlight because they are amazing and they deserve some attention too. My name is Tash Hatcher and I am a wildlife artist and lifelong animal lover. I run a small business called Hatchling Makes, where I sell wildlife-inspired enamel pins and stickers, and every sale helps to raise money for wildlife conservation. In each episode of this show, I will be chatting about a different underappreciated animal, from horseshoe crabs to cassowaries to rock hyraxes and everything in between. I'll be sharing fun facts and telling you all about these incredible species, from where they're found to what they eat to just what makes them so special. Before we go any further, I do want to add in a tiny disclaimer. I am not a wildlife professional in any way, shape, or form. I am just an extreme animal lover, but I will do my very best to research these creatures to the best of my abilities so I can bring you their stories as accurately as possible. So without further ado, let's dive on into today's episode. Hi everyone! Welcome back to the Underappreciated Animals podcast. If this is the first episode that you're listening to, then welcome. Thanks so much for choosing to listen. And if you're a long-time listener, thank you so, so much for tuning back in. I can't believe that this podcast is two months old already. I am having so much fun recording these episodes. It's really a bit of a dream come true. This is episode four of the Underappreciated Animals podcast. I will say I do sometimes wish I had picked a slightly shorter podcast name, (laughs) but here we go. Uh, And today I'm going to tell you all about the Akapi. Akapis are one of my all-time favorite animals. They are definitely in my top 10. They're such incredible creatures, and I am lucky enough to live in London, where at the ZSL London Zoo, they have an Akapi enclosure. And so I have been able to see them up close, as close as the public can get to the Akapis at London Zoo anyways. Um, And they are just so charming and wonderful. And I'm so incredibly excited to record this episode because I think they're so often misidentified and so underappreciated. If this is your first time listening and you are wondering what to expect, this episode is going to be filled with fun and interesting facts about Akapis, and hopefully you'll learn something new about these amazing animals. We'll be covering what they eat, where they're found, and where their scent glands are located. And spoiler alert, it is not where you'd normally think a scent gland would be. So without further ado, let's dive on into this episode. So, as always, we are going to kick off with what an akapi looks like. Akapis are another one of those animals that's sort of a mix of several animals put together. A lot of times, folks think that they're actually a subspecies of zebra or a cross between a zebra and a giraffe. And typically at zoos, they do tend to be located close to the zebra enclosures, so I can absolutely see how folks can look at a zebra and then look at an akapi and think that they're related. But in actual fact, akapis are related to giraffes, not to zebras. The zebra confusion comes from the white horizontal stripes that akapis have on their rump and legs. And like I said, I can totally see why they are misidentified as zebras a lot, because you put them next to each other and it does look like there's a family resemblance there. Akapis are about the size of a small horse at around five feet tall, which is just a little smaller than the average human height. So if you're about 150 centimeters tall, then you are about the height of an akapi. And akapis have these huge ears that sort of remind me of a baby deer, that kind of oversized look when the deer hasn't grown into their ears yet. It's so cute. I think that's what makes me love akapis even more, just because it makes them look so endearing. (laughs) Pun unintended, (laughs) but I'm going to roll with it. Um, The ears of the akapi can also move independently of each other so that they can listen out for predators. We're going to hop back to those white stripes that I talked about earlier. So just like a fingerprint, those stripe patterns are different for each and every individual. So that is how each akapi is identified in conservation work. Now, whilst I was researching this episode, I did come across some suggestions that the white stripes also help with thermoregulating, which is something that has also been said about zebras. Now, I'm not saying that this is definitely the case, but there is some scientific reasoning there, and if it's true, that is pretty amazing. 
So I said earlier that a copies and drafts are related, and there are some similarities in how they both look. Both of them have a long purple, blue, black colored prehensile tongue, which they use to strip leaves off trees. And male copies also have ossicones, which I'm really hoping I said correctly, <laughs> which are those little horn like bits on their head, which again is the same as a giraffe. Acapis also have pretty long legs, so again, like giraffes, when an acapi is at a watering hole, they have to sort of spread their legs out so that they can bend down and drink. And I always think of tripods when I see acapis and giraffes do this, because <laughs> it sort of forms that triangle shape with the two front legs and then their head bent down. If you imagine viewing them from the front, it looks exactly like a tripod. I couldn't find out what this was called, but I feel like we should just call it tripoding. <laughs> Who do we talk to about making this happen? <laughs> One last thing about the physical characteristics of copies, which I actually didn't know until I was researching for this episode, is that their coats are basically thick velvet, but they're also really oily, and that is to make them waterproof, so sort of like duck feathers. I just find that fascinating, because when you look at an copy, you wouldn't think that it would feel oily. You'd kind of imagine it's like petting a cow, so I would imagine it's maybe short and a little coarse, but they are a species that is found in rainforests. Uh, we're going to get into that in a second. So it makes total sense that they have got this like little quirk to keep them dry. So, acapis and giraffes are the only two members of the scientific family Giraffidae, and acapis are also known as forest giraffes, which I think is really sweet. And that sort of brings us nicely to where acapis can be found. So, as the name suggests, acapis are found in the rainforest, specifically the rainforest of the Democratic Republic of the Congo, and that is the only place that you can find them in the wild. Acapis are diurnal, so they are mostly active during the day and they eat plants in the understory, so they are really reliant on the rainforests. They can eat up to a hundred different plant species, including ones that are poisonous to humans, and they eat between 45 and 60 pounds of food a day. Now that's a heck of a lot of food. Acapis have four stomachs, similar to a cow, and that helps them to digest the more difficult plants that they may come across. They also supplement their diet by eating things like charcoal or even clay to gain their minerals into their diet, so sort of like horses with a salt lick. Now, acapis are really, really elusive, so much so that they were actually unknown to Western scientists until 1901. And I'm specifying Western science here because they were well known to the Congolese locals for generations and generations before that. What happened was that Western scientists heard rumors of a striped donkey living in the rainforest, and when they went to investigate, they discovered acapis. <laughs> Now, I always wonder how we as humans could miss a huge animal like an acapi for so long, because it's not like Westerners hadn't been in the Democratic Republic of the Congo before then. The first Western explorer was there in 1870, so that's a good 30 years. But then I watched a video of an acapi walking away from the camera into the forest, <laughs> and within a few paces, it had totally disappeared. Those stripes help to camouflage them into the trees, and I can totally see how we would not have seen them. It was very much a blink and you miss it sort of thing. And whilst we're on the subject of finding things out relatively recently, and to sort of underscore just how elusive these animals are, the first wild acapi was only caught on camera in 2008. And the first wild baby acapi was only spotted again on camera, in 2018. That was so recent. It was caught on camera as part of a camera trap program called Team Akapi, which began in 2016. And with the baby Akapi, the team actually saw the pregnant mother on camera, and then a few months later saw the same mother followed by the baby. How amazing is that? Imagine being the scientist who spotted that. Now, there is a reserve that you can go visit as an ecotourist to try and see an acapi in the wild. But honestly, they are so elusive that even field researchers wait for weeks or months to see them. 
So if you do want to go see an Akapi, then the zoo is your best bet because there is a zoo breeding program, which from what I can tell is worldwide to help boost up their numbers because Akapis are classified as an endangered species. And that breeding program is pretty successful from what I could tell. My search results from looking up Akapi breeding program brought me loads of news articles about new Akapi babies being born in London Zoo, Chester Zoo, Bronx Zoo, San Diego Zoo, Zoo Basel. (laughs) You get the idea. Actually, the last Akapi to be born in London Zoo was pretty recently in 2020. Now, the only natural predator of the Akapi is the leopard, and they've developed some really interesting sort of quirks to protect themselves. So, for example, babies, once they are born, they can stand after 30 minutes, same as giraffes or any other sort of prey animals. But they will also hide in a nest where they spend most of their time, and then that way they are hidden from predators, and their mothers will fight off any predators that come near the nest. And then, as another sort of, how many is that? Three? So triple layer of protection. (laughs) Baby copies won't poo for up to 60 days after they're born so that they don't leave a scent for a predator to follow. Considering that some animals just abandon their babies once they're born, and it's a bit like, good luck, survival of the fittest, (laughs) it just sort of warmed my heart that Akapi mothers and babies go to so much trouble to protect themselves. Now, I did promise to tell you where an Akapi's scent glands are, and they are located on the bottom of their feet. I did tell you it wasn't where you thought they would be. (laughs) Akapis are solitary animals and they are also territorial, so by having the scent glands on their feet, it means that they can quite literally mark their territory wherever they go. Male Akapis will have fairly large territories and then they will overlap with several female Akapi territories, which will be quite small. So those scent glands will really help them to know whose territory is whose. And those scent glands leave a sticky, tar-like substance on the floor. So it is a super clear mark. No one can argue with it. It's literally like putting your name on it. So there you go. Now you know all about a copy scent glands. So I mentioned earlier that Akapis are endangered. There's actually a forest reserve in Democratic Republic of the Congo called the Akapi Wildlife Reserve, which is home to around 20% of the entire population of wild Akapis. The reserve is also a UNESCO World Heritage Site, and on the UNESCO website, it says that there is around 5,000 Akapis living in the reserve. So if we say that's about 20% of the total world population, we're guessing at around 25,000 individuals. Now that is a huge guess. I'm not sure when the UNESCO website was last updated with the population levels and there is always room for error, etc, etc. So don't quote me on it, but let's say best case scenario is that there's 25,000 wild copies left in the world. That's still a really, really small number. So threats to Akapis are all the general ones you may think of when you think of an animal which lives in the rainforest. So deforestation and mining, because that obviously reduces their habitat and also their food source. Like I said before, Akapis are super, super shy, so they don't tend to hang around in areas where there is heavy human activity, but they do get poached, mostly for their hides because of their distinctive stripe patterns, but also they can be hunted for their meat. However, they are a protected species in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, so that is great, great news. Akapis are also considered an umbrella species. That means that conservation efforts to save the Akapi also helps to save loads of species which live in the same habitat. So that will be things like monkeys and birds and bugs and insects and frogs, all kinds of animals. Akapis are really loved in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. They're actually the national animal and it's one of the animals which is featured on their banknotes. I love it when native wildlife is celebrated on things like banknotes because it really helps to widen the awareness for that species, especially when they're endangered. Plus, I just think it's really, really cool. How much cooler would it be to have a 20 pound note with like a beaver on it or a peregrine falcon or an adder or a slow worm? I just think that would be so, so fun. 
So I think I'm going to start wrapping up the episode here because otherwise I'm going to talk for another 10 minutes. <laughs> Acapis are honestly so, so amazing. And I hope you discovered something new about them today. Thanks again for tuning in and for listening to the end, folks. And I will catch you in the next episode. Thank you so much for listening to the Underappreciated Animals podcast. I hope you found this episode fun and interesting. And if you did, then please reach out. Let me know. I would love to hear from you. If you love animals and you would like to help support this podcast, you can check out my website for my small business, Hatchling Mix, which you can find at hatchlingmix.com. Or if you head to the show notes, I'll leave a link there. It's got wildlife inspired enamel pins and stickers and stationery and all that good stuff. Plus 10% of every sale is donated to wildlife conservation. Also, if you have a moment to leave me a review, I would be super grateful. That really helps me to know that I am sharing the animal stories that you want to hear. You can also discover more underappreciated animals by listening to the other episodes, which are available wherever you get your podcasts. And don't forget to subscribe whilst you're there so you don't miss out on any future episodes. New episodes will come out every other week on a Friday. I'm also taking animal suggestions, so hop on over into the show notes to find out how to do that if you have an animal you'd like me to highlight on the show. Bonus points if you mention one that I have never heard of before. That's all from me. Until next time, take care, folks.